Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome. My name is Simon Neem. I'm Dean of Libraries here at UMass Amherst, and I am very uh, pleased to welcome you uh, today to our 19th annual uh, fall library fall reception here in the beautiful renovated old chapel building. So for those of you who haven't been here in quite a long time, um, it's absolutely uh, gorgeous, um, the renovation that's been done. And as I learn a little bit about my um, uh, being fairly new here, as I learn a little bit about UMass history, uh, I learned that there was, in fact, the very first library was in this building. So long history and a wonderful place to be having our fall reception. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this absolutely beautiful afternoon. Um, welcome friends of the library, guests, and also our special guests from uh, the Network for Grateful Living. And um, welcome, it's great to see you all here. So we are pleased today to be honoring the gift of the collective papers uh, and works of Brother David Steindl Rast to our special collections and university archives. It is through gifts like these that we build our collections focused on social change and, um, sorry, social, I lost my place, social change and support the community of activists and scholars here on campus and increasingly through our digitization efforts around the world. Now you will hear more about our plans to digitize many of these important papers later on through the program. But for now, I'd like to get things started with turning it over to our head of special collections, Rob Cox. Thanks, Rob. Well, I can't help but be personal here. A few years ago, I was uh, thinking about some friends of mine from high school whom I hadn't seen for a long time, including my closest friend. And I happened to run into his father, who's a very well-known molecular biologist. And I said, have you heard from Tom lately? And he says, I hear from him all the time. I said, well, I'd like to talk to Tom. I haven't talked to him in 30 years. So I, I said, I'd like to talk to, to my friend Tom. So his father gave me his phone number. And I called him up. And Tom said, what do you do now? What do you do with yourself? And I said, well, I'm an archivist. That's a pretty bad thing. Uh, What's an archivist? Well, you know, an archivist is someone who feeds off of someone else's papers, their, their <laughs> letters. We read diaries. Basically, we spend our lives reading other people's mail. <laughs> and I said, well, Tom, what do you do? And he said, well, for the last 30 years, I've been a Buddhist monk. And I thought, OK, not much different than you were in high school. And that was my background when, about a year and a half ago, Katie and Aaron Rubenstein came and said, hey, we might have an opportunity to talk to these people about the papers of a, of a Benedictine monk. And I thought, well, for me, what does monasticism mean? It means monastic solitude. It means living a hermetic life. It means detachment and withdrawal from society. All those things sound to me like a typical family vacation for me. <laughs> but. In this case, I thought it might be interesting to look a little further because they were insistent that this was an interesting opportunity for us as an archive. And just want to say for just a couple of minutes why it is an opportunity. And it's because what we specialize in in special collections is documentation of social change. And for us, it means that what we don't do is document any individual single movement. We haven't set ourselves up to document the peace movement or environmentalism. We haven't set ourselves up to think about social justice in some limited sense. We haven't set ourselves up to look at the way people make change politically or extra politically. What we've done is decided to focus on the connections between and among movements, how things interconnect. We found pretty securely, pretty certainly, that there's no such thing in life as a single issue activist. If you're active in one area, you're active in another. And it's because everybody who looks at problems in the world sees connections differently. Everybody who acts on those problems does so understanding that to solve, to, to address one problem requires you to think about and act on other problems. When I heard about Brother David, 
with his background in the Second World War, surviving through Vienna in the Second World War, emigrating here in the early 50s, and finding the monastery that he wanted to live on for the previous 10 years, had been dreaming about living on. And when he found that, and he said, I want to live strictly by the rule of Benedict, and that led him somehow mysteriously into Zen Buddhism, and from there, somehow mysteriously into interfaith dialogue, into promoting peace, into promoting social justice, into civil rights, and everything else that Brother David has been involved in. It didn't surprise me one bit. The one thing I remember more than anything at Brother David's birthday last year in San Francisco was him talking about what it was like to work within the Benedictine community, to be a Benedictine for virtually all of your adult life. And he said it was like a well. You may remember this. It's like a well where you dig and you dig deeper and deeper, and you find you can still dig deeper until you finally get down to the waters at the bottom that connect us all. And that, for us, is what we mean by social change. And that's why Brother David is a great fit for us. So with that, I think I pass off to Christy. Is that right? I hope. <laughs> Christy Nelson, who is the CEO of the Network for, a Network for Grateful Living. So thank you. <clears throat> what a beautiful gathering. Um, so on behalf of the board and staff of a Network for Grateful Living, I want to extend our most sincere thanks to all of those um, involved in bringing this extraordinary moment to fruition and to all of you gathered here. It means so much to us to look out and to see so many old friends and new. The generosity of the Friends of the Library in organizing this event has been nothing but amazing every step of the way. Thank you, Carol Kinnair and Kim Phil, for being so thoughtful and accommodating and making this special day unfold with so much heart. And to Dean Neem, I know you're new here, but I see really great things ahead for you. So to Rob Cox and Aaron Rubenstein, and to all those from Special Collections who have been involved in lovingly and painstakingly excavating, organizing, and celebrating the voluminous archives of Brother David. I hear they're measured in, is it measured in yards? Linear feet. This guy has a lot of linear feet. He's kind of small, but he's got linear feet of archives. I have to say that you have proven yourselves the most deeply trustworthy and dedicated partners to us. Your caring and careful preservation of the teachings and legacy of a man we deeply love and a teacher whose life holds tremendous power to inspire a broad swath of the universe for decades to come has been nothing but impressive. Your professionalism and your deep personal interest in these archives have consistently moved us and made us know that we have a true partner in perpetuity at you at SCUA. I'm going to call it SCUA. Thank you. You will hear much more about Brother David from my colleagues in a few minutes, and they are the far better ones to talk about it. But I want to seize my own little moment to say that even though I've been blessed to be the director of a Network for Grateful Living for three and a half years, my personal history with Brother David goes back 15 years, when I first met him at Lynn Twist's house in San Francisco and immediately developed my first and only true monk crush. <laughs> Honestly, Within moments of meeting this playful, present, profound, robed man, I was smitten. While Lynn was busy, we spent time walking and talking and even went to Cirque du Soleil together. When we parted ways that year, I wrote him a long letter professing my adoration and hoping to keep in touch. I now had a reference point for a depth of connection and attention that dwarfed most others. I told my partner we needed to ratchet up our spiritual connection. I was smote, and I was sure it was mutual, and it was, along with the mutual affection that Brother David shares with many, many thousands of others who've been left monk-crushed in countries around the world. <laughs> when I applied for the position of executive director of a Network for Grateful Living 12 years later, and having not been in touch with Brother David in all that time, I was eager for him to remember me, and I kind of think he did, but regardless, what I knew was that working to spread a message about living and loving gratefully that had been seeded by this amazing man was an appointment I did not want to miss. 
It takes a truly extraordinary person in their late 80s to co-found a global online nonprofit organization. It is even more extraordinary when that person has spent much of their life sequestered as a hermit and a monk, not exactly a techie. Brother David is a true visionary, and his original vision of a network for grateful living offering, offering online support for offline living is still ours, and its relevance has only grown in the years since we began. Our web-based sanctuary is a rich source of Brother David's teachings, those that, we, those that we can house on our website. Now to have Brother David's real life archives housed at SCUA here means that there will be more study, more scholarship, more insight, more understanding, and more spread of the important teachings that Brother David has offered the world. Teachings that are more timely and seem more timeless and needed more than ever now in our lives. As one indication of how cutting edge and visionary Brother David is at 91 years old, right now he's attending the International Transpersonal Conference in Prague. This conference bills itself as, and let me quote, a global gathering aiming to radically review our reality. The subjects include transpersonal psychology, deep ecology, psychedelics, science, quantum physics, technology, shamanism, religion, spirituality, and art. That's all up Brother David's alleys. <laughs> Thought leaders, including Brother David Stendarest, they say in their promotion, will discuss the global crisis and the future of humanity, reconnect us, and move us toward unity. So that's what he's doing right now. He's sorry he can't be here. Um, <laughs> This is not exactly a lowly charge, but one to which I am sure Brother David offered a very significant contribution. From this conference, I want you to know that Brother David sent a message that he asked me to read to you. And if you know his writing, this is, you can tell that's his email. <laughs> it always starts with a little cross. Dear friends, this is to you. You have come together to celebrate an event that is important to me, and I regret not being able to join you in person. My heart is certainly with you, and I welcome each one of you most cordially. My thanks go to Rob and Aaron and the team who have put so much work into creating these archives. And my thanks go also to each one of you who have made the effort to come and celebrate this opening ceremony. Sounds like the Olympics. I've just given a talk at the International Conference of Transpersonal Psychology on mystical spirituality as a link between world religions. Topics like this, and above all, the practice of grateful living will be important for a long time after I'm gone. So I'm deeply grateful that some material that might prove helpful is being archived and made available. Still more important, however, is that you, my friends, archive in your hearts and share with others what you find helpful on your spiritual path. Please do this, and I pray that you will find much joy in doing so. Heart to heart, your brother David. I feel so lucky that I get to read that. It makes everything else I have to say not so important. But um, So we're deeply honored to be here, deeply honored to SCUA, the library, UMass. So grateful to be neighbors with you in this amazing collection and to offer you our support. Um, I'm going to now invite up Margaret Wakeley, who is our uh, Program and Community Relations Coordinator and has been working as uh, a person to help Brother David with his worldly travels, his worldly communication, his worldly thinking since 2005, um, and in addition to all the other amazing things she does with the Network for Great Living, and she also travels the world and sings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm so, so thrilled to see this coming to life after, you know, we first were sending out emails to friends and relatives of Brother David's to um, ask if they might um, give up their precious um, memories and physical uh, gifts of Brother David's that had been sent to them through the years, so we're just so grateful for all of that. Um, I'm going to give you some brief highlights of Brother David's life. Can you hear me okay? I wanna make sure you can hear me all right. From um, 1926 to 2001, and at the same time I'm gonna be showing you images that may or may not correspond to what I'm saying, but I think you'll really get a kick out of them. You'll love seeing them anyway. 
Um, most of the images that you see here are scanned and are in the archival collection here. So born in Vienna, Austria on uh, July 12, 1926, Franz Kuno was the oldest of three brothers. He was an adorable, precocious boy. When he was seven, his parents separated and his mother Elizabeth took the two younger boys to a small village in the Alps and Franz, having started school, had to stay at Vienna with his father, who promptly sent him to a boarding school. But not for long, his mother found out how miserable Franz was and she went and kind of kidnapped him and brought him back home to be with the family in the Alps. Franz spent all of his teen years under the Nazis. He was 12 when Hitler came to power in Austria and 19 when the occupation ended in 1945. Back in Vienna, those early years, the city and houses were in shambles. Food was scarce and life and safety were unpredictable. The only thing that they could rely on was the priest who came through the houses at the same time every day serving communion. As Brother David said later, that meant something and continues to mean something to me with all the problems I have with the institution there was the institution at its best. With Hitler being against the church, Franz's adolescent revolt against the establishment meant going deeper into his Catholicism. Around this time, he became interested in a little book that he found called The Rule of St. Benedict. And with more acts of rebellion, visited monasteries where he was really not allowed to go. He was drafted into Hitler's army, but thank God, he never was sent to the front lines. He used all of his drill and barracks time for uninterrupted prayer. And he also cultivated his, quote, Christian duty of always questioning authority, after, especially after undergoing frequent humiliations by his superiors. Who said that and why, he would ask to himself, probably. After several months of serving, he and two others escaped and his mother hid them f at home for three months. <clears throat> Sometime in the summer of 1943 when he was 19 years old, you can see that Brother David found some rare peace being a shepherd. <laughs> I adore that picture. After the war in the summer of 1945, he volunteered to work with the thousands of refugees flowing into Austria, helping to provide them with food, shelter, and a renewed sense of confidence. He then entered the University of Vienna to resume his studies in majoring in art and then psychology, eventually earning a doctorate in psychology in 1953 with a minor in anthropology. From 1947 to 1949, he helped to publish the children's magazine in Vienna, Der Golden Wagen, and you can see these um, upstairs in, in um, the library. They're just amazing, amazingly beautiful um, hardcover collections of these magazines. He was actually too young to legally be the publisher, so he had to put his mother's name there as publisher, but he was actually the publisher. Both Franz's mother, who he and his brothers called the Lion Mother, um, and his maternal grandmother, who was the first woman to ever speak on Austrian radio, were energetic activist women, with what Brother David would describe as having that special woman's power, a life-giving power that fosters new life and growth. After World War I, his grandmother worked to help war orf orphans, and she would come to the U.S. to raise funds, so she ended up spending like half of every year in the U.S. So after World War II, his mother and his two brothers emigrated to the U.S. Franz also visited here several times in the 1950s. He often said of that time that he was torn between finding the perfect girl or the perfect monastery. There were plenty of really wonderful girls in Austria, but he had never found a monastery that kind of lived up to this original rule of St. Benedict. Then on one of those trips to the U.S., when he was visiting his mother in New York, a friend said he, he heard of this new little monastery in Elmira, New York that sounded kind of like what Brother David was looking for. So he hopped on a bus, 
and hitchhiked the rest of the way to Mount Savior Monastery and almost immediately joined that community and became Brother David. Soon, his abbot at Mount Savior could see that Brother David had some talent for speaking and teaching. He was really great to really see that and really support that in Brother David. Um, and sent him out in the world to teach about monasticism. In the process, Brother David started reading about Buddhist monks. We heard about this before. He read Dr. Suzuki's The Training of the Zen Buddhist Monk, and he discovered all these little details that were exactly like the rule of St. Benedict. They didn't borrow it. It just happened to be exactly the same. So he was fascinated by this, quote, common methodical effort to deepen our awareness of that reality that gives meaning to life. And he received Vatican approval in 1967 and was sent by his abbot. This is um, Father Winsen, what, what Damasus. Um, he received Vatican approval in 1967 and he to participate in Buddhist Christian dialogue. And he lived in New York in a, in a monastery for three years. This began a busy time of active Buddhist Christian dialogue. And he met with and was encouraged both by Thomas Merton and Thich Nhat Hanh. Interfaith dialogue continued with Swami Sachi Dananda, Rabbi Gelberman too, and in 1968 they formed this nonprofit called a Center for Spiritual Studies, which also included Aido Roshi, Pir Vilayat, Inyat Khan, Yogi Bhajan, and Sri Shin Moy. He also met often with Rabbi Zalmor Schachter, and in 1975, Brother David received the Martin Buber Award for achievement in building bridges between religions. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Brother David was actively involved in civil rights, peace movements, and the development of communities. Together with Thomas Merton, they ignited a renewal of religious life. In the 1970s, he was a leading figure in the House of Prayer movement, which affected more than 200,000 members of religious orders across the United States and Canada. It emphasized renewing one's spiritual life through prayer and spiritual practices, something he's been a proponent of throughout his life. He helped Peter Stewart found Thanksgiving Square in Dallas, Texas, a place of inclusion and diversity devoted to the spirit to all that brings us outside and beyond ourselves. It was at the encouragement of Peter Stewart that Brother David carved out time in 1982 as a guest at Peter's house to write Gratefulness, The Heart of Prayer. Brother David has written several books, two just published last year when he was 90, and oh, I forgot to bring a copy of here to show you, but they were, I think they're in, they're downstairs. His autobiography called I Am Through You, So I, just this past month, it was published. And I know he's working on something else. He just keeps, he has so much to say. He's also written books with other writers, including Fritzjof Capra, Robert Aiken, and Sharon LaBelle, and he's contributed to countless other books. During the 18, 1980s and mid-1990s, Brother David lived in different spiritual communities outside of Mount Savior, from Maine to California. While he was living at New Camaldoli Hermitage in California, he was asked to fill in for a teacher at Esalen, finding out once he arrived, he said, oh yes, yeah, sure, I'd love to do that, and he arrived only to find that the subject of his talk was, was called The Trouble with Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> but he jumped in and he, I'm sure he gave an amazing <laughs> class. And he went on to go back to Esalen every year and there's some people in the audience who have been to his film workshops with Francis Liu for like 25 years. He was even there last year. He came back to live in a hermitage in Ithaca in 1997 and that's where I met him in 2005 when I joined the team. So the basic rhythm of Brother David's life has been living as a hermit for half the year and the other half traveling and offering retreats and lecturing, giving workshops, often with other spiritual leaders. Indeed, he is taught all over the world. And as Christy said, he continues to do so, although he's keeping himself mostly in Europe these days. Claire Hallward wrote a book called David Stendelrost, um, Essential Writings, and she wrote in that, Echoes of delight can also be heard in Brother David's understanding of spirituality as aliveness, with gratefulness 
as the measure of that aliveness, a theme that runs through all of his talks. He buoyantly gives himself up to all people, whether his audience consists of starving students in Zaire or faculty at Harvard or Columbia, Buddhist monks or Sufi retreatants, Papago Indians or German intellectuals, New Age commune visitors or naval cadets at Annapolis, missionaries on Polynesian islands or Green Berets, or participants at international peace conferences. In the late 1990s, Brother David met a young student, a computer genius from Serbia, who was going to Reed College in Oregon. His name was Daniel Ivanovic. They bonded over their shared history, albeit decades and countries apart, of living in war-torn countries, carrying the same ever-questioning of authority. Daniel immediately appreciated what D Brother David had to say and teach and said to him, Brother David, you should have a website. To which Brother David responded immediately, yes, um, what's a website? When Daniel described what the World Wide Web was and websites, Brother David said immediately, well, forget about a website about me. How about one whose purpose it would be to create a community of gratefulness using the internet as a tool to bring people together? So together with friends, they started putting that dream into action. And on Thanksgiving Day in the year 2000, gratefulness.org was began under the umbrella of the Center for Spiritual Studies. The Fetzer Institute gave the first grant to get the website started, and then there was a gathering after that to, um, to establish the nonprofit to move from a spiritual center studies to a network for grateful living. And I recently discovered this report that the meeting um, that he presented at that meeting, Brother David, which still resonates today. Here's some of what Brother David said in that report, and I'm going to be ending with this. What our world needs most is a unified worldview, a shared spirituality, like the one which gave to all creative periods in history with their cultural cohesion and power to give the meaning to the lives of individuals. Gratefulness is so universal in experience and, the, and at the same time so central and so powerful in transforming both individual lives and society as a whole that it can fulfill our contemporary longing for unity. At the core of many communities all over the world, and as a driving force in many of the finest efforts, a rejuvenated spirituality is emerging, which may well be characterized as a spirituality of grateful living. The task of our network for grateful living is not so much to make something happen, but to identify the many communities in which it's already happening, to make them aware of it and to help connect them, thus strengthening their joint impact we do not need an additional community or movement, but rather a nerve center that connects existing ones and amplifies their shared energy. He goes on to say of gratefulness.org, it helps to bring the networking about. It serves the purpose of the network by facilitating an exchange of ideas and by giving online support to offline action. A Network for Grateful Living is one example of Brother David's efforts to bring forth his vision for our world. And we are so fortunate to be a part of it. Thank you for um, having us here. And I'm going to introduce um, Aaron Rubenstein, who is the university archivist and digital expert here. And he's going to come up and tell you a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So I, um, I was asked to, to make a pitch, actually, for support in our digital, digitization efforts of Brother David's uh, material here in the archives. And as a native New Englander, the idea of talking about money, especially asking for it, is, is deeply anxiety causing for me. <laughs> So as a result, I'm actually not going to talk about money. Um, I, I actually want to talk more about how exciting, and, and I think Christy did a lovely job too, talking about how exciting this partnership is for us. And I think one of the aspects of this partnership that I mean is becoming more and more clear to me as the days pass is how we are two organizations who 
deeply understand the power of, of online engagement um, and the reach of online engagement. Um, the stereotype for many years of archives is that you know, we are a dusty repository um, of, of some kind of magical horde that's guarded by a dragon. Um, and you know, that stereotype was, was never always true, um, but especially in the last 20 or so years since the advent of the World Wide Web, much in the same way that Brother David had the vision of, of, of what uh, an online community could do in terms of connection. Um, archives have, have come around to that same realization too. And, and we've certainly seen this in SCUA, as have many other archives, that being able to put our material online radically democratizes access to archives. Um, what used to require a plane ticket and usually um, a couple nights stay in a hotel, uh, the ability to make the time to do that traveling, not, not even you know, mentioning the money, um, is now available freely online all over the world. Um, and, and we've seen this power um, and, and the work that's come out of that power and the realizations that have come out of that power um, just by, by putting our material online. So as a result of that, we've built um, over the course of a number of years um, you know, very robust infrastructure for supporting digital collections and digitization in SCUA. Um, we have um, you know, gathered equipment, we have developed um, expertise, we have a, a digital repository that we call Credo, which allows us to take all this digital material and put it online and making, make it accessible to the world. Um, and you know, through our, our years of experience in doing this, we've learned where to put that material, right? It's not enough just to put things online. You know, in the, in the early days of gratefulness, um, uh, the early days of a network for grateful living, Brother David, um, saw a unique opportunity and, and, and was, a, was a, a real unique visionary in, in the possible possibilities of the web. Now, everyone uses the web and it's filled with noise, right? So what we've learned from our experience is how to put this valuable information in, in places where people can find it, on social media, on Google especially. Um, we are, are constantly surprised um, by the various ways that people find our material and the various purposes that, and benefits that they can get from the material that we've made available. And, and often there are, they aren't the audiences we, we originally expected. Um, so, I mean, as you've seen, um, if you had a chance to look at the exhibit in, in the library, and I, I strongly suggest you, you do when you have a chance, uh, but also just the, the images that were included in, in Margaret's um, talk, which were all actually material from the archives. Um, that Brother David's collection is particularly rich, and, and Christy had mentioned that we measure Brother David in linear feet, both in depth and in breadth, and I, and I think that's true, and, and actually his collections are 75 linear feet of material. Right? So what you've seen is, is not even 1%. It's, it's, a, it's a fraction of a percent of, of the richness that's in that collection. Right? But by that, but that small little bit that you've been able to see, I, I, I hope it's clear the power that, that, that lies in, the, in this very rich material. So um, as, a, as a Yankee, um, as I've warned you already, um, I don't think we need money Right? Or I certainly don't like to say that we need money. I'll put it that way. Right? We've worked very, very hard to build the infrastructure that, we, that we've built. Um, and because of that infrastructure, we're able to do digitization all the time on the budget that we already have. Right? We never stop making our material available online. However, it is a daunting task. Um, our digital repository Credo has 180,000 individual items in it, which ranks us within the top 15 of online digital collections in the country. And that, that list includes the Library of Congress and the New York Public Library and Harvard University. Right? However, all that digitized material represents maybe 1% of our entire collections. Right? So we probably won't digitize everything, hopefully, in my lifetime, because we <laughs> continue to collect at a more rapid rate than almost any other repository I've ever been familiar with, right? Um, however, the, any, any ability to build any kind of capacity radically enhances our ability to make material available. We recently received a $7,500 grant from uh, the National Archives to digitize um, material in our collections representing the experience of war. 
Um, so that experience is from soldiers on the front lines or from uh, returning soldiers who are disabled and need support um, in, their, in their lives forever forward, um, and also conscientious objectors at home. Um, and by that very small, relatively, infusion of cash, because of the infrastructure we've built, we're able to, to immediately start a digitization product like that and scan what's going to be tens of thousands of items um, within a year, in fact, probably under a year. Um, and, and actually, we've built this capacity um, within the last couple weeks. And it's been really exciting to see all of a sudden the archives fill with students who um, not only provide very inexpensive labor, <laughs> but also are open to the possibilities of historical research and are, and are often very excited by the materials we get to work with. So we're very excited about the opportunities that we have in front of us, um, both in terms of making social change uh, material available to a, a wider audience, uh, but also especially um, with the Brother David material, having an opportunity to, to continue to expand uh, the audience of, of, of his teachings um, and his material. So thank you very much. So I also have the pleasure of um, introducing our next speaker, who has served as Brother David's travel assistant and companion for nearly a decade. He's the grandson of Cesar Chavez and currently works for the Oakland-based Education Trust West, which advocates for educational justice and high academic achievement for all California students, particularly those of color and those living in poverty. I'd like to welcome Anthony Chavez. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to begin by saying uh, a deep thank you to uh, everyone here at UMass Amherst, especially oops, especially those who are working in the Special Collections and uni University Archives Department. Um, really thankful that we've found a home for Brother David's life works. Um, I also want to take this moment to introduce all of my lovely colleagues and friends who are part of a network for Grateful Living. So if we could have um, our team members raise their hand or maybe take a stand real quickly. Um, Christy, Saoirse, Katie, and Margaret. Um, and Jessup. I'm so sorry. Jessup, come on, you gotta stand back up, our friend. So Jessup just joined us. This is our first time meeting. My apologies for forgetting, but he's part of the, the new young and uh, young and lively energy that will hopefully continue to take gratefulness.org on for generations to come. Um, it's, it's really neat to, to be up here and to be given this honor of, of sharing this afternoon with all of you. Um, because I thought of a lot of other people who could have come up here before me. Are, is we having some trouble with the slideshow? I think I may. Oh, I accidentally right clicked. Um, because there's so many people, as we have heard, coming into Brother David's lives over the years and the generations who have done so much to to help him along his path and to eventually help in, in what became the culmination of a network for grateful living. Um, so what you're going to see up here are some of the pictures that I was fortunate enough to take um, from our travels and journeys uh, over the, the period of about seven years, which covered uh, much of my 20s and, and well into his 30s. Um, so, so yeah, enjoy, and, and I'm going to share a little bit of uh, stories about my time and travels with Brother David. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, a big thank you again to, to the folks here at UMass and to our lovely uh, team of angels, as we used to say. Um, because everywhere we went, we would meet people who would talk about just the contributions that a Network for Grateful Living was making to them in their daily lives. And they would refer to team members by name. And that gave us sense, such a deep sense of satisfaction um, to know that we had such a lovely team who was right there behind us after all of our visits and who was helping to share and to, and to spread this important and timely and, and just invaluable wisdom that Brother David um, Reoffered. 
So I think a lot of you are probably sitting there and wondering why you're hearing from this 30-nothing-year-old Latino <laughs> from California who isn't a monk um, about the travels with this 90-year-old Austrian Benedictine monk. And it's really funny um, how Brother David and I met. Um, as you heard, my grandfather was Cesar Chavez, and so growing up in California, over the years we would get invited to share and to visit and to lecture, which I continue to do in schools. And it just so happened that one year my father had been lined up to be at a peace conference that took a train from Los Angeles to San Jose, and it was in honor of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and his father, Cesar Chavez. And so my dad, being busy running his nonprofit, uh, the Cesar Chavez Foundation, um, just got stuck in a pinch and couldn't make it. And he brought me into his office. And then I was a young religious studies student. And so he said, uh, hey, Anthony, you know, you're into religious studies and peace and that stuff, right? Yeah, why? What's up? Um, I really need you to go cover this event for me. They've printed me into the brochure. They're expecting me to be there and to share. But if you can go, I think that'll, that'll, that'll hold them over. <laughs> and so me as a young college student, um, I said, sure, why not? I have friends in the Bay Area. I could visit them at their colleges. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to Sacramento. So I'll loop it all in and have a fun little weekend. And I arrive in the morning, and much like today, I'm invited to sit in uh, some chair up at the front, which means I'm important, but really I just carry an important namesake. And so I'm sitting up front, and again, much like today, I pull down my reserved piece of paper, and I fold it in half, and I start scribbling notes as, as I was then listening to Brother David share some um, really insightful lessons. And this was the type of everyday wisdom that I was really seeking and was yearning for as I was going through my degree in religious studies. Um, there were incredible speakers who spoke about things with such great eloquence and, and a very you know, academic perspective, which Brother David has both of, yet still he's able to find the everyday words that, that really can grab hold of our hearts. And, and as he used to say and remind me and many others over the course of his sharing, um, knowledge is what you can grab, but what grabs hold of you gives you wisdom. And I believe that was a quote of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Again, one of these very old classical figures who I never um, encountered in, in my religious studies, but I was fortunate enough to just be opened up to through my relationship with Brother David. And so as we're at this peace conference and I'm listening to Brother David talk about the ego cage and the importance of living gratefully and I'm scribbling notes furiously, I, I'm, I'm laughing and I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. I got everything I needed. I'm on my way and going to leave this conference and they won't know who I was. And, you know, there's a thousand people here. They'll be fine. And as the coincidence always worked out with Brother David on the road, I was invited into some lunch with dignitaries and luminaries and I didn't know anybody, and again, I was kind of a fly on the wall, so I sat down and was enjoying my lunch before being on my way, and Brother David, being the friend that he is of everyone, um, brought his lunch over to join me, and we started to talk, and he told me about his website, and I told him about my, uh, my studies in college, and about a month after this conference, after learning about who Brother David was and realizing I had missed this wonderful opportunity to have a primary source in one of my papers for college, <laughs> as you know, it, it wasn't about life questions then. It was just about graduating college and getting on to whatever was next. And and after I'm kind of you know kicking myself in the bottom uh, for not interviewing Brother David for this paper on religious studies and the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. Um, I find out that Brother David wants to make contact with myself um, through the conference organizers. And I say, sure, go for it. And so I was introduced to Brother David through the conference organizers. And Brother David tells me at the time, you know, he's 80 years old. He thought he was retiring, but, you know, there's been a change of winds and there's been some mysterious messages that came to him and informed him that it's time for him to, to continue to be back out there. And he thinks he's going to start a farewell tour. And, and little did I know that this farewell tour was going to turn into, you know, seven years, seven amazing, incredible years that filled up a passport that I never thought I would ever use. 
um, with just amazing travels and, and life lessons and incredible friendships. And so as I finish up college, I'm reacquainted with Brother David, and one of our first trips is to, um, to Hawaii, where as you saw in one of the pictures, Brother David was boogie boarding. And so that was one of the first things that I did with Brother David was take him out to the beach and, and to go boogie boarding. And it was really funny because we said, you know, after we realized the wave that we had pushed him into and how massive it was, he said, man, that could have been a real game changer had he, <laughs> had he not made it out of that wave smoothly, you know. We would have all been in a lot of trouble um, had we not taken, you know, such wonderful care of this uh, precious cargo. And, and at that point, Brother David, uh, in time, he tells me again, you know, the, the reason I brought you out here is I wanted to talk to you about maybe helping me out with sharing in this generation of my life. And so we're hanging out, enjoying the beautiful coastline of Hawaii, and he pulls out his, his calendar, his paper calendar, and I have my iPhone or whatever it was, cell phone. And he starts telling me, okay, coming up in, in March, we're going to be in uh, Santa Fe and in Albuquerque and New Mexico. Then in uh, May, we're heading to Vienna and to Rome. Uh, then we have a quick stop in Barcelona before we're back in California for the summer. And then after a couple of weeks in the summer in California, we'll take a break, wash our clothes, and then we're back to Europe for another you know, six, maybe eight weeks. Do you think you're up for that? And, I was just laughing. I was beside myself. I had never planned that far out ahead for anything in my life. <laughs> you know, the cities that he spoke about were cities and towns I was only familiar with through the skateboarding videos that I watched at that, at that point in my life, and which I still continue to watch. Um, and so I tell him, like, yeah, why not? Sure. Um, you know, it was a time to start saying yes to things in my life. And so as I graduated college with my religious studies degree, not knowing what I would do with it, I all of a sudden became uh, the companion of a very revered and well-respected and sagious, almost holy man. And it was funny because I would go a lot of places and people would naturally ask me, so are you going to be a monk? Are you going to be a priest? And I was like, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not here for that. Um, you know, how did you get the job? I want your job. This is a job of a lifetime. And I'm just like, I don't know. I, I don't even know why he wants to hang out with me. Like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, as a lot of, you know, my generation tends to say. Um, but I see him um, as I, and I saw him then, and I still continue to see him as, as a very special grandfather. Um, and so, I said yes to this journey with Brother David, again, not knowing what it entailed. And, you know, at his age, uh, one of the first things I experienced while being out on the road with him in, in Rome at the time was just, just his age. And, and sometimes, you know, even though he had all of the spirit and enthusiasm, he would just run into the constraints and the limitations of his age and would fall asleep at meetings. And I was new to the scene, so I didn't really know where to fill in. And so I would, you know, do what I could to help him keep awake, get him coffee, get him water, you know, help him to just follow the meeting and, and to engage in the way that I knew he wanted to. And I remember telling him on that first trip, you know, Brother David, if, if you're doing this because you think you've met a friend who you want to show the world to, you know, you could just call it off. You've done far too much. You've lit too many torches of wisdom in the world, and it's time for us to carry that wisdom. And you don't need to be out on the road, you know, working yourself like this at this age. And, you know, we thought about it, and we thought about it, and finally he told me, no, this is really what I want to do. And I said, perfect. If this is what you want to do, and this is, you know, because you feel this is what you need to do, then consider me there. And the first couple years of our time together was really about my duty um, to Brother David as somebody who had asked me to, to accompany with him in this phase of his life. And as I was uh, alluding to, it became a sense of a filial obligation, you know, taking care of this new grandparent. And over the course of the years, as time went on, and I saw that, you know, while yes, I did a lot of things and I helped to make his life very easy, in a lot of ways, he still didn't need me. There was many wonderful friends and angels along the way, many people to drop him off and to pick him up, and, and he would be just fine getting around. Um, but it became more of a deepened sense of service 
as I saw the network that he was growing and was building and was maintaining, all of the wonderful friendships that he had around the world. And, and it felt like one way that I could be of service to um, an incredible person who had given so much. And, and of course, I was going to learn a lot, but, but my duty wasn't to be there to, to soak up this wisdom from this man. I knew it was to really just learn from his example and his life lessons, and, and everything else would just come along the way. And so over the years, I was fortunate enough to be invited to join a network for Grateful Living. And those trips took us all over the place, at times to even go find uh, Daniel Ivanovich out in Croatia so that we could talk about you know, the new developments of the website and so that we could entertain um, invitations from, from generous benefactors to do more and to expand the network and to translate it into, um, into Chinese and to translate the website into Spanish. And so it became a, a really, a really neat, you know, project to do with Brother David as we're out there and being with this incredible individual who's still in their mid '80s was finding their own personal apex. And and it was incredible because as you saw in some of the pictures, we were able to, you know, help Brother David to go back and to share with friends like His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Boston, and to travel to Plum Village to be with Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and to meet other friends in faraway places that wasn't even their home base. Like the one year we were in Hong Kong and we ran into Father Anselm Grun in the Hong Kong airport because these uh, high, you know, flying, much in demand monks are just going from all corners of the globe sharing their wisdom. And lo and behold, who would imagine that the place for two uh, German speaking, you know, well revered monks would be Hong Kong airport of all places? over a cup of Starbucks coffee. And so those are some of just the funny, you know, occurrences that happen over the years with Brother David. But as time went on and, and as I acknowledged that, well, yes, you know, we enjoyed the travel and sometimes it also wore on us in ways that could only wear on people who travel for six months together out of the year and oftentimes, you know, share very confined spaces. Um, I realized that it was much more about our friendship and it was about our companionship. And as I was saying, for me, it became about making the road work for him and rather than him working on the road at that age. Um, so as much as I could, I tried to, you know, bring a, a lot of fun and jest and mischievousness into our time together on the road. Um, you know, taking him out to go see more museums, uh, dragging them along with me to the pub to go watch soccer matches or whatever it might be. And, and over the years, we, you know, exchanged different forms of knowledge when he taught me about the classics and poetry and literature and art. And I would share with him more contemporary forms of graffiti and hip hop. And we would talk about skateboarding and, and the joy that I felt and the communion that I felt with my body and the, and the earth. And, and he would tell me about how, you know, some of the most fun he would have over the years and sharing and would be, you know, the workshops that we co-led. Um, it would be the trips that we took in Guatemala where for a whole month we lived with uh, poor Claire nuns where Brother David thought he would help me finally make my confirmation. But after a month of sharing and reading poetry and literature and reading the news, I told them I can't be here. I have to be out and involved in the world, involved in my community, you know, sharing the important lessons that I've been so fortunate to learn from and inspiring the next generation as you've done with me. And, and it was neat because uh, most recently, this picture was taken from a visit that Brother David made um, in the spring of this year in May. Um, Brother David had announced earlier this year that he was going into retirement from his extended travels and lecturing. And of course, as things work out, um, what do they say? Life is what happens around the plans that you make or something like this. Brother David got an invitation from Miss Oprah Winfrey and her, her network. And it was something that, you know, to be honest, we had been seeking and we really thought, you know, Brother David would be a wonderful presenter on her Super Soul Sunday program. And so lo and behold, after Brother David makes this announcement of his retirement, we get an invitation from Oprah Winfrey's team to, to come out and to be filmed for their Super Soul Sunday project. 
And so we tell Brother David, you know, this is something that we've all thought about for a long time and really hoped would happen. And maybe you'll really consider, you know, coming out and making this trip. And so he said yes, you know, said yes, that he would come. And I was fortunate to spend five days with Brother David on the road uh, earlier this year. And it was filled with a lot of laughter and many trips to the museum with friends and wonderful meals. But mostly we just talked about the fun that we had. And we, we talked about, you know, all of the wonderful memories that, that we made. And I reminded him, you know, that now with this archive um, that's coming together and with everybody dedicated to Network for Grateful Living, that the, the wisdom that he's reminded of us in, this, uh, in these times will continue to, to live on and that his spirit will, will continue to be with us. Um, so I just want to end by saying, you know, once again, thank you very much uh, to everyone here at the UMass Amherst Library and the Special Collections and University Archives. Thank you again to everyone at Angel and to many of the wonderful friends who are with us in the room who I know supplied personal archives um, to help make the collection what it is. Um, and, and yes, thank you all very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Wow, well, Brother David wasn't here in person uh, with us today, but I really feel like he was here in spirit, especially through the wonderful stories uh, and, and, and anecdotes and, and, uh, and the ways he's touched so many lives. Um, thank you uh, to our speakers, Christy, Margaret, and Anthony for sharing your personal take uh, on your how Brother David has touched your lives. Um, thank you to my wonderful colleagues, Rob, Aaron, and all the staff at um, Special Collections and Uni University Archives for all their work in pulling together the exhibit and all the future work that's going to happen to digitize this wonderful collection so it can have a real impact um, to people around the world. I do want to encourage you to see the exhibit while it's on. Uh, Special Collections and University Archives, floor 25. That very tall building just behind the window there. Uh, do not go to floor 24. T 24 is all archive storage, which I've been told by Rob is guarded by a dragon. So do not go there. Um, we also have part of the exhibit right down in our learning commons. This is open uh, 24 hours while the building is open. And the really wonderful thing about having part of our exhibit down there is there are hundreds of students studying in that space and working together all around that exhibit. And when I popped down there on Friday, uh, I saw about five students gathered around uh, looking at the material. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to have this material there to really, um, maybe it'll just be one or two that come away and say, wow, what, I, that, that looked really fascinating. I want to learn more about that. They'll come up to special collections and find their way into learning about more uh, of Brother David's wonderful work. So thank you all for coming here. Uh, it's great to see so many of you friends and supporters of the libraries and a network for grateful living. And have a wonderful rest of your Sunday and weekend. Take care. Thanks. So I, I, um, in 2005, we hired somebody to record Brother David as part of kind of a promotional, educational um, CD about a network for Grateful Living. And this um, Gary Malkin sat down with him and he said, Brother David, just imagine you're, you're greeting a group of people and telling them to have a good day. So out poured this spontaneous five-minute meditation by Brother David that has touched millions of people since then, since we made it into a, a short, like a slideshow on YouTube in 2006, and then other people have made versions of this meditation. And just this year, we made an updated version of A Good Day. It's now called A Grateful Day. And we'd like to leave you um, with that film. And I'm assuming that you guys have that up there, because I'm, that you can uh, start it. 
Um, so we're really, we're just delighted. It's his original voice from this original recording and it just has new updated um, moving images that I think you'll enjoy. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you. Today. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. All that life from generations and from so many places all over the world flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. Turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water. And drinkable water. A gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day.